Welcome to Eye on America. I'm Michelle Miller. Today we show you how the power of innovation is helping communities across the country. We'll dive right in to why shark infested waters are having an impact on Southern California's economy. And we'll visit a New Jersey town with a potential solution to make recycling easier. But first, we turn our attention to a major development for anyone needing mental health support. A new three-digit national hotline number, 988, could help save lives in more ways than one. Here's Jeff Begates. A lot of people have these same concerns, and so I'm glad you called today. This is an example of what you will hear when you dial 988 the new National Suicide and Crisis Hotline, an easy-to-remember lifeline for those dealing with mental health challenges and crisis in the U.S. We are here 24-7, uh, um, so uh, we answer the phones um, all, you know, all the time. Erica Turner is the Chief Clinical Officer at Community Crisis Services, one of about 200 call-in crisis centers in the country. If you're wondering you know, whether or not you should call, I think that's an indication that you should call. More than 52 million people in the United States identified as having a mental illness in 2020, but only 46% received treatment. Meanwhile, the national suicide rate has jumped nearly 30% since 2000. Experts say the new three-digit number will provide a simpler way to get emergency care. Jameson Brill is the call center director. Our workers work with them to process what's going on that's brought them to the crisis state that they're in, help them, help them identify means of staying safe if they're having thoughts of suicide. The 11-digit suicide prevention hotline takes in more than 3 million calls and messages a year. With the new three-digit number, volume is expected to more than double by next July. We want to, for people to know that it's okay to call. We want people to know that it's okay to um, you know, have feelings, to be in crisis. But that expected increase in calls is fueling concerns of staffing and infrastructure shortages in several states. Former U.S. Surgeon General Dr. Jerome Adams. We know for this hotline to be successful, people need not just an easy three-digit number to call, but they need someone to actually answer that call and they need uh, resources to be able to refer individuals to. Uh, we know that's not in place in a lot of the United States. The Biden administration and Congress are taking steps to help, increasing federal investments to $432 million, $282 million to scale up crisis centers nationwide, and $150 million as part of the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act to amplify the new 988 hotline. But if we don't build out the infrastructure and, the, and provide the funding for people to be able to get the services that they need, then uh, ultimately this could be a failure moving forward. And we don't want that to happen. One goal of the new number is to lessen the burden on 911 and provide an alternative for those fearful of involving police, as police officers are often not trained to deal with mental health crises. According to the Treatment Advocacy Center, people with untreated mental illness are 16 times more likely to be killed by law enforcement. 90% of the time, we're able to de-escalate the risk in the, in the crisis over the phone. Dr. John Draper is the executive director of the Mental Health Lifeline. A person that is in mental health crisis, getting a, a, an ambulance, or getting a, 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 a police response is not a calming sort of response. What many of them need is somebody to come to them who understands, listens, and helps them get to a safer place. Now to the coast of Southern California where great white sharks are living close to shore. Carter Evans tests the waters to see how these wild animals are impacting the local economy in an unexpected way. Stunning images of great white sharks sharing the water with swimmers in Southern California's busiest beaches are now a common sight. It's these drone views that have really changed our understanding of how sharks behave around people. Chris Lowe, director of the Shark Lab at Cal State Long Beach, says the juvenile great whites here are up to seven years old and mostly ignore people, but sometimes they get curious. It's no different than a neighborhood dog, right? You're out walking with somebody and the dog comes over and gives you a sniff. And in fact, if you do make a move toward a shark, 
they tend to go the other way. Exactly. We see this over and over again. We witnessed it last summer. This shark is just swimming so calmly and so gracefully right now. Okay. Get in the beach now. Which is why I'm now comfortable enough to get into these shark infested waters with Lowe's research team. They had me help swim a massive fishing net to researchers on the beach. There you go. Where they capture and tag some of the sea life the sharks might be feeding on. And Lowe says people just aren't on the menu. But on the rare occasion a shark bites a person, it makes national news. The swimmer was badly injured today in a shark attack. For a shark attack. Following a shark attack. The shark lab now wants to understand how all of this is impacting local economies. A couple years ago, we had a woman that was bitten. I was at a city council meeting in Huntington Beach, and I heard that there was a $7 million loss in hotel reservations. But there's also evidence shark bites can have the opposite effect. With more people becoming shark enthusiasts, a West Virginia University study found an initial increase in hotel bookings three days after an attack. But after that, the bookings drop. This all comes down to people's perceptions. Exactly. Economist Dee Dee Long is working with the Shark Lab to study the financial impact. Some people might think, oh, I take it really seriously. I don't want to go to the beach. But some people might think, oh, this is really exciting. I actually want to pursue this opportunity. At this Santa Barbara beach, it's now common to see a dorsal fin break the surface offshore. Uh, hello, shark. But the sharks aren't hurting business, according to surf shop owner Sam Holcomb. When I educate the stand up paddle board renters about the sharks, very few choose to not go. When people are on the beach, sharks are pretty far down the list on their list of concerns. Tourism so professor Katie Dudley is working with the shark lab. People come out here, they go whale watching. Can you see a day when people come out here and go shark watching? Oh, absolutely. That's why this team is so great and unique because we're coming at it at every different angle so that hopefully we can make a truly sustainable model to help have a thriving tourism destination right next to a thriving shark population in our oceans. And there are so many of them here, the sharks are easy to spot. I found one. He is right on the water. This is the same area where we were just swimming that net to shore. So we just saw our first shark of the day. I'm gonna get on the paddleboard. We'll go see if we can find him. With the shark lab team watching. Oh, he's right there. He is literally right here. We you found a great white shark close to nine feet long. Wow, look how big he is. But as we try to verify its length next to my paddleboard. Look how close to shore we are. Look, his fin just broke the surface right there. We discover my balance could use some work. The shark is right there. Just about 10 feet off. Coming up, a new approach to recycling plastics. We'll show you how one small town could be a model for the entire country. This is Eye on America. Reduce, reuse, recycle. It's easier said than done. In 2021, the U.S. generated roughly 40 million tons of plastic waste, but only 5 to 6 percent of it was recycled. Meg Oliver takes us to a New Jersey recycling center trying to fix that problem. Got that one? The first Wednesday of every month, Starting at 7 a.m., six public utility workers canvas Red Bank, New Jersey, in search of white buckets full of plastic film. So how many miles do you cover when you're doing this? Well, we do the whole town. Foreman Don Andrews says in just a few hours, his team collects enough to fill several trucks. Wow, that didn't take long for you to fill that up. Hard plastics like bottles and takeout containers can be recycled in curbside bins. Soft plastics like bags, wrap, and mailers most often cannot. The difference is often lost on well-intended consumers. I've always been into recycling very much, but I didn't realize the plastic film was a separate thing. This pilot program gives residents the convenience of curbside recycling through a separate plastic film pickup. In the sound of nearly 13,000 people, hundreds are participating. Did you realize how much plastic film actually existed in your house? No, that's what I'm saying, and I'm an environmentalist. Red Bank Council President Kate Trigiano says the program appealed to the town's environmentally conscious population. It really is something that's so 
prevalent in our lives and it's something that cannot be taken in the regular recycling stream. We followed the plastic from Red Bank to a recovery facility where recyclables are sorted and bundled for final processing. There, we saw household waste from other sources with bags mixed in with paper and cardboard. A big problem because plastic film will jam the machines. This stuff can be very detrimental to the system. It can wrap around uh, a lot of the shafts, a lot of the bearings. Operations manager Carlos Batista says he needs to shut down the facility for two hours every day to remove it. It could actually cause either fire or mechanical damage. The plastics industry keeps telling us, oh, we can recycle everything. So I've, I've created a collection. Um, all these things aren't recyclable, but yet they're labeled telling us they're recyclable. Jan Dell is fighting plastic pollution through her organization, The Last Beach Cleanup. She recently co-authored a report that claims only five to six percent of all plastic waste in the U.S. is actually recycled and particularly post-consumer plastic film, there's no evidence that any of that is getting recycled. It's just too hard to collect. It's all types of different plastics, and they can't be recycled together. Many product labels tell consumers they can recycle film at store drop-off locations, but Dell says the plastic collected at these sites is often so contaminated with other garbage, it can't be recovered and worse. So by putting all these, these recycle symbol on these things when they're actually not recycled and then confusing consumers to think they can just put them in the bin is really bad. We have inconsistent guidelines, lack of consumer education, and really a confusing process where most consumers don't know what goes in the bin. Joshua Baca is with the American Chemistry Council, which represents chemical and plastic manufacturers. He says the industry is working to ensure more plastic packaging can be remade into new products. Billions of dollars has been invested in advanced recycling technology that is critical for recycling more of the film that we use today. And frankly, there is a huge demand for recycled material. But Dell says cost is a major hurdle towards realizing those goals. There just really aren't plastic processing factories in the U.S. who want to buy waste plastic and try to turn it into new plastic. Why? Because new plastic is so cheap. This is probably at best a B grade film. Weeks after our visit, the plastic film from Red Bank was still waiting for a processor to accept it and use it to make a new product. It's a critical step on the road from waste to recycled. Now a story of the often forgotten history of how hundreds of black men and women sued for their freedom back in the 1800s. Chris Van Cleve introduces us to a descendant of enslaved Americans making a memorial to his ancestors a reality. The sound of history being remembered. A story of freedom fighters being honored. Cast in more than 8,000 pounds of bronze and standing nearly two stories tall. This monument's installation in front of the St. Louis Civil Courts building is the emotional end to a story that began two centuries ago. Missouri law held if a person was once free, they were always free. It allowed slaves like Dred and Harriet Scott to sue for their freedom. The Scott story, spelled out in these handwritten affidavits, convinced an all-white jury to free them. This was really based on family preservation. Lynn Jackson is their great-great-granddaughter. They were there to save their daughters. They hid them away for possibly up to two years just to keep them from being sold during this process. For about 20 years, there was a sort of a golden age of slave freedom suits. Historian Kenneth Wynn was the Missouri State Archivist when a court clerk made a startling discovery. The Scots were not alone. Buried in old court records and lost to history until the late 1990s were at least 306 so-called freedom suits brought by slaves in St. Louis seeking their freedom. Wynn estimates more than 120 cases were successful. It shows the collective effort of a people trying to be free, who did not rest and just accept their lot in slavery, but resisted it. It really speaks in some ways to people who believed in the integrity of the law. Tucked inside this case file from 1821, the jury's findings. 
handwritten by its foreman, we, all the jurors, find that the plaintiff is free. This is something that St. Louis should honor. You had to be pretty brave and courageous just to file the suit, because if you lost, the consequences could be dire. Circuit Court Judge David Mason, a descendant of slaves, spent the last 14 years pushing for a freedom suit memorial. Its installation brought him to tears. And when I'm reading these files and reading the affidavits of the slaves, I mean, I'm hearing them. I'm feeling them. I'm hearing my people. These were some of the strongest people over 500 years that have ever been produced in American society. These freedom suits were hard-fought legal victories. Remember, it's the middle of the 1800s, so a slave walking into a St. Louis courtroom wasn't allowed to read or write, couldn't even testify in a court of law. The judge and jury consisted solely of white men, and Missouri was a slave state. Here's a time when the jury was likely biased against, yes. the, against the person suing for their freedom. The judge was likely biased in some ways against them, and that they still, the system still worked. Yes. What does that say about justice. That means that it can work. Truth is powerful. Facts are powerful. Having the strength to look falsehood in the eye and call it out for what it is, is powerful. Funded by private donations, the towering sculpture entitled Freedom's Home is set to be officially unveiled as the nation celebrates Juneteenth. The names of all 330 known Freedom Suit plaintiffs will be added around its base. What do you think Dred and Harriet would say? They would be happy and they would be proud, but they would totally feel like they did not deserve all of this recognition. A piece of American history, once largely lost, well worth recognizing and remembering. After the break, meet the man whose mud is used on every baseball in the big leagues. We'll dig into that story next. To close our show, we unearth a little-known baseball tradition, how mud is applied to every single ball used in America's pastime. Brooke Silva Braga takes us to the secret location of a small family business along the banks of the Delaware River for a look. At the end of a suburban street, somewhere in New Jersey. How often are you out here? At least once a month. Jim Bintliff led us through the woods. This is the spot. At the bank of a tributary of the Delaware River. Gotta watch a step down. We reached Jim's own strange, secret field of dreams. What's so good about this mud? The geology of this area is um, unique. We had promised not to reveal the exact location. Uh, my boot might be staying in New Jersey. And when his assistant no-showed, agreed to help with the work. Uh, here, you want me to bring the bucket over? Yeah. At the end of his shovel, the peculiar mud jiggled like pudding. What I want is the sediment that is a mixture of clay and sand. For three generations, Jim's family have been the only people carefully harvesting the only substance legally applied to Major League Baseballs. Do you remember your first time coming out here? <laughs> first time I ever shoveled mud, I was nine years old. And who brought uh, you out? With my grandfather. The story of the mud starts with tragedy. In 1920, Ray Chapman was fatally hit in the head by a pitch with an old, dark ball. Baseball soon mandated new balls for each game, but they came slippery from the factory. In search of a better grip, Lena Blackburn, a Major League player and coach, found this special mud by his New Jersey home. Before long, it was the Major League standard. Lena Blackburn and my grandfather were childhood friends. They used to fish and swim around here. When Lena found the need for the mud in baseball, he and my grandfather would come out and uh, do this. Blackburn eventually turned the business over to his friend, who turned it over to his son, who turned it over to Jim. It's a gift. I love this. <laughs> this ain't gonna be easy. Brrrah. But hauling 45-pound buckets of mud back through the woods is no walk in the park. Ugh. Jim eventually plans to pass down the grueling business to his daughter and son-in-law. 
The next time a pitcher grabs a ball, doesn't like the seams, and throws it in the crowd, I'm going to take personal offense. I don't. <laughs> Cha ching <laughs> But the charming, homespun nature of Lena Blackburn baseball rubbing mud, still processed exclusively in Jim's garage, is a bit out of step with the modernized, optimized direction of today's game. It's a romantic story, it's great, but it's 2022. We gotta find a better way to treat the baseballs. Last year, Major League Baseball cracked down on the equally old tradition of pitchers sneakily using foreign substances on the ball. And that hit him. This year, coincidence or not, pitchers complained the balls were too slippery. The MLB has a very big problem with the baseballs. I mean, they're bad. Everyone knows it. Every pitcher in the league knows it. What did you make of people complaining about the balls being slippery this year? All I could tell them is not my mud. My mud has not changed. But in response to the complaints, last month MLB announced new league-wide standards for exactly how to apply the mud. I spread it in my palms. Yeah. Which is meant to remove the factory gloss without leaving behind easy to grip yeah. scratches. All they do is they'll massage it around. At least that's how it works for now. Other grip substances have reportedly been auditioned this year in the minor leagues. Did you worry at all about them not wanting to use the mud anymore? That would bother me if they decided not to. Cause couple words I'd have for them, but it's, <laughs> uh, it wouldn't kill me. In addition to the big leagues, Bentliff ships mud to many minor league, college, and even high school teams as well. The latter can get by on one small $25 jar per season. For most of his life, Jim worked as a short order cook. His dad was a carpenter, his grandfather a baker. But this unique family side hustle has managed to sprinkle a dusting of the bent lifts onto the fingertips and bat barrels of every baseball moment you're likely to remember. Does it still register to you when something big in the sport happens? Guy hits a record-breaking home run, wins the World Series, yeah. that your mud's on the ball. Yes. Yeah, that's why I do it. <laughs> I ain't getting rich here. That's why I do it. For more stories like these and live coverage of breaking news 24-7, stream us right here on CBS News. I'm Michelle Miller. Thank you for watching Eye on America.